Okay. Okay, so we'll get started. Let's get to the lecture. Share screen here. All right, so we've got the development, um, embryo development, sometimes it's called early development, sort of have a few changes here. So we're going to do two parts. First, fertilization implantation, and then I think there was the typo. I just said part two was the first trimester. Well, part two is really just gonna be the second and third trimesters. But I really, really wanted to point out to you, for those of you that um, may be affected by some of the images, there are images of embryos and fetuses that are no longer living. They've been removed from the uterus. Um, uh, so I just wanted to prepare you for that. Some people that are unprepared or uncomfortable with um, seeing those kind of images, you may want to not participate. Oh, let me stop sharing. I forgot to hit the optimizing of the video so it won't hopefully hopefully this improved the sound a little bit um okay so i wanted to point out there are some just images that some people find very disturbing and will be very uncomfortable to see so they are images um not drawings actual photographs of embryos and fetuses that are dead and so i wanted to prepare you for that and let you know that if you didn't want to see that and you know and, and I'm certainly understandable you can step out and not participate in this particular lecture and there are other lectures I believe the embryo lecture that's posted on our regular canvas page just has the drawings and sketches and not these images if I remember correctly so the reason why these images are there is really to give you a sense of the size and um, level of development at each particular stage that we're talking about. So um, there is a purpose there. It's not a shock factor. But again, I wanted to point that out to you so you um, are not shocked. And, um, and I wanted to prevent you from moving on if this is something that would first bother you. Okay, so with that <laughs> dire warning, let's begin. So part one, we're really going to talk about fertilization, implantation, and the rest of the first trimester. Part two will go on to the second and third trimesters. So for this chapter, the primary um, focus would be on this part one. There's just a few benchmarks that we'll go through um, with the part two. So the primary focus again should be about right after fertilization takes place, this whole cleavage, implantation, the germ layers, which is the early formation, embryonic membranes, those are the membranes that are supporting the embryo and its development, the placenta, what it looks like, what hormones it produces, as well as the umbilical cord. So this here is the primary focus of this entire chapter. Probably 75% of the questions would come from this section. So this is a, an image from a textbook, um, from the McGraw-Hill textbook specifically that is a quite a, a nice image to show you the progression over a week of an egg that has been fertilized. So we can see obviously the egg, where's my pen, starts in the ovary at ovulation, it leaps out. So there it is, it's been ovulated, it's been ejected out of the ovary. It goes into the um, fallopian tube, the fimbriae gather it up. And it is really in this ampulla, which is this wide funnel portion, that fertilization is taking place. So we can see that here. We see many sperm are going to go to the egg, but only a single sperm will penetrate the egg. Then once fertilization takes place, this is considered the point of conception. This is considered, it's now a whole cell because it will have 23 pair of chromosome for a total of 46. So now it's a whole cell and the process from this point forward is going to undergo mitosis. Remember through here to form the egg as well as the sperm in the seminiferous tubules, it was meiosis. But now once that we are a 46 chromosome cell, mitosis is going to be the process. So then we have this pathway where we can see 
it's forming as a zygote. So a zygote is the name of this fertilized egg. And it's um, then this progression here, we can see that it divides in an exponential manner. We go to two, to four, to eight. We move on within um, 40, 70, sorry, 72 hours. It's a marola, which is just a ball of cells. It becomes a blastocyst. It has to be this blastocyst where actually the ball of cells is here. And then we have kind of an empty shell around. It has to be at this stage for implantation to take place. So I pretty much just told you all the important things that we're just about to go through, but I wanted you to see it in a big picture because we're gonna go through it step by step. So fertilization, in order for fertilization to take place, we obviously have ejaculation of sperm into the female reproductive tract. The sperm are gonna migrate toward the ovaries. So that's what their little tail kicks in. Um, they're self-propelled, again, the tail. The uterine and fallopian contractions facilitate sperm movement up and over towards the ovaries. The um, ovary is obviously gonna release the egg. The egg is only viable up to 24 hours. So it's very, very short. Oh, why is this on a timer? Sorry. It's a very short window for the egg to be available. That's why for fertilization to take place, often it is in having sex at the point of ovulation. It's actually having sex a few days prior to ovulation because it takes a while for the sperm to make it over to the egg. And so um, sperm can survive up to four days. So you can actually have sex up to four days earlier and then still be at risk prior to ovulation if risk, right? or I don't know, depends on your perspective on being having an egg fertilized. So in this case, you can see this great picture here. This is an egg surrounded by thousands of sperm. Sorry, this thing is still in a timer. So it's happening in the ampulla. And the ampulla is the most common site for fertilization. If it happens outside of the ampulla, it's known as an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, I'm going to stop the share briefly so I can switch over and stop the tiny slideshow. Okay, sorry, I have got to stop this timing here. Get this out of here, discard. Going back to the share, sorry about that. Oh, some pictures I was going to not show you. Sorry. Got some pictures I'm showing you, and I tried to pare them down a little bit. Um, okay. So we have obviously the sperm and egg. This is taking place most frequently in the ampulla. If it happens outside the ampulla, it's known as an ectopic pregnancy, meaning out of place. Ectopic. Um, could be out in the abdominal cavity. It could be inside the fallopian tube. Um, well, that's more, I guess, if it implants in those places. But the most common site for fertilization is the ampulla of the fallopian tube. There are thousands of sperm that are gonna make it around the egg, but only one gets in. That sperm, one single one, penetrates not only the corona radiata around it, but the zona pellucida is sort of the hard shell, for lack of a better description, that the acrosome of the sperm is going to actually penetrate and get the nucleus of the sperm inside the egg. So at this point, the male and female chromosomes will combine, and now we have a total of 46 chromosomes after this point. The oocyte is going to finally complete meiosis II. So the very slow process of meiosis in the female. For the male, it was completed when the sperm were actually formed. But for the female, there are these halted stages of development that doesn't complete until actual the point of fertilization. So in this picture here, I have the yellow representing the corona radiata, a series of cells that actually ovulated out of the ovary with the egg. The pink represents the zona pellucida. So the corona radiata is just a bunch of cells. It's easy to, for sperm to maneuver within. The zona pellucida is a lot um, more of a tougher barrier. So a single sperm will make it in 
detaches and it will combine, its chromosomes will combine with the egg's chromosomes. But you can see additional sperm are not then allowed to enter. Here's a really cool picture I saw um, of a sperm and an egg to show you an actual representation um, so you have a sense of size. So it's now a called a zygote. This is the fertilized egg and it's 23 pair, which also is known as 46. Um, so a zygote now is 46 chromosomes. Let's erase this, it's now in the way. The egg is gonna provide an X. So the egg will always be an X. The mom always provides the X chromosome to the child. The male can either provide an X or a Y. So the sex of the child is determined on whether it's an XX, which means it'll be a female, or an XY, which will be a male. So these are just some pictures. You don't know, need to know this part. It just was quite interesting. If you're really interested in embryology a lot more, this um, University of New South Wales down in Australia has probably the best site in the world for embryology. So this is just showing you um, the zona pellucida, really fabulous images of um, the early cells as well as many, many development stages. So they've got it colored here where you're actually looking at the maternal and the paternal chromosomes that are combining. You can see the two here, the red is the mom, the um, green is the dad, and you can see them combine. You can see it combines in a number of configurations um, and then they pull away and so that was the zygote. And so we have a series of mitotic divisions. So you can see on the image right below, see how it's two and then it goes to four and it continues. The solid mass is actually a marola. So you can see this is the marola on the head of a pin, a tiny little pokey pointy pin. Over here, I want you to notice that the cells increase in number exponentially, but they do not increase in size. So the overall dimension of this marola, although there's more and more cells going inside, does not get bigger and bigger. It doesn't do that um, for the first week, but it does increase in cell number. So what we have here is by day three, three-ish, we have this marola, which is a solid mass of cells we saw on the previous slide. After about a week, we get to this blastocyst stage. This is the stage that you have to get to in order for the egg to implant. So we the blastocyst will have two areas. This lump of cells inside is known as the embryoblast or the inner cell mass. And then the outer portion, so if there's like a big soccer ball, and it's, think of it as a hollow soccer ball, so this is all hollow space, except for this lump of cells shoved off to the side. So this ball portion is the trophoblast, and that's going to be extra embryonic membranes. That means like the placenta and the amnion and the umbilical cord, things like that. So you either have the future embryo or you have the accessory structures outside of here. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So again, embryoblast and trophoblast, those are the two components of a blastocyst. Here is my representation. So we have this, if sort of a funky little representation, but we have, remember, these are the follicular cells. We had the egg, we have the corona radiata around it. So this is to remind you that here we have sperm. So we've got, we're including sperm in this conversation now. Ovulation takes place. So remember, here's the egg. It's on its way. This is at the ampulla. This is those follicular cells that are remained back in the ovary. They are going to puff up to become the corpus luteum, but right now they're just sitting there for the purpose of this animation. We finally get the sperm and egg meet. We actually see this is the corpus luteum. If you remember what it secretes, it secretes progesterone. What does progesterone do? It um, causes the endometrium to activate glands. Oops. 
So it's telling the endometrium here to activate glands because there are going to be, or likely in this case, a fertilized egg that's going to implant soon. So it's actually targeting this endometrium to get it to start secreting. So now it's putting the endometrium into the secretory phase. So here we have the egg and sperm together. This is gonna be day zero. Once fertilization takes place, it's a zygote. And then now we're moving along. It does not get bigger because it has to stay small. Otherwise it'll get obstructed and stop in the fallopian tube. So although we're increasing in cell number, the overall dimension does not increase. So here we get moving along. By the time we get to the end of the fallopian tube, it's become this blastocyst and enter the blastocyst stage. It is at this stage that it will then implant into the wall. If for some reason it gets fertilized farther down and it arrives into the uterine um, area with like at the marola stage, it won't stick to the wall. It'll just continue to go out. So in this case, we show you an implanted blastocyst. So we're gonna sort of recap the blastocyst. Remember, we have the trophoblast, which is the outer shell. We have the embryoblast, which is going to become the embryo itself. Really, this movement into the blastocyst stage is the first time the cells actually made a decision. And the decision being, hey, part of you guys are gonna develop into accessory structure part of you guys are gonna develop into what will become the baby. So this is actually the first time differentiation has taken place. So the trophoblast at this point of implantation, it's critical that we have a trophoblast in place because the trophoblast is going to be what originally taps into the glands, but in order for this egg to take place, the trophoblast secretes a hormone known as human chorionic gonadotropin. Human chorionic gonadotropin is the hormone that a woman pees out onto a stick that determines whether she's pregnant or not, or someone takes a blood sample and evaluates. So human, the presence of human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG is the determining or definitive factor that says, hey, you have an implanted blastocyst in your uterus. There is no other way to get that. So what is the purpose of human chorionic gonadotropin? It is, it goes throughout the whole entire body, but its target is actually this corpus luteum. And what it does is tells the corpus luteum to continue to secrete progesterone. Why do we need a hormone to tell the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone when it already was? Does anybody have an answer for that? And unmute and shout it out if you want. Because I'm because a certain amount of time. Is going to Fantastic. I don't have the name. Right. Was that Jackie? Yeah. Okay, good job. So the corpus luteum only lasts for two weeks. 14 days, and then it just shrivels up and dies, and there's no more progesterone. But we need progesterone, and also remember, if there's no more progesterone, the hormone levels drop so suddenly that the walls of the endometrium will fall apart, and this implanted blastocyst and the endometrium will just fall out and be menstruated out. So in order for this implanted blastocyst to stay and to stick, so to speak, it is doing the self-preservation by sending human chorionic gonadotropin to the corpus luteum. And it says, hey, I know you are going to give up after 14 days, but you know what? I'm gonna keep driving this production. And it maintains the corpus luteum secretion of progesterone so that we keep the glands here churning out all kinds of um, glycogen like substances to keep providing nourishment because it's going to take several weeks for a placenta to actually get made and for this baby to tap into our blood supply. So it needs progesterone to keep the glands secreting and the glands are really what's feeding it. So that's what's so important about HCG. Now HCG starts off really low and obviously increases. So if you are taking a pregnancy test and you're negative, well, it could be a false negative. You just maybe didn't have enough that exceeded your renal threshold that it didn't go out in your urine yet, or it went out in such low levels that the test didn't pick it up. But so you can have a false negative sometimes, but you can't have a false positive. If it's there, 
it's there. There's nothing else that could make it up. So once this, actually I'll go back here. So once this trophoblast sends out human cornic and endotropin telling the corpus luteum maintain progesterone so our endometrium keeps secreting glandular substances to keep it alive. So the trophoblast does two things. It does number one, secretes HCG. It's usually written with a lowercase h for human and then chorionic, chorionic gonadotropin is in capital letters. And number two, it actually produces little villi, distributals, they're like finger-like projections, and those are tapping into the glands. So it's actually bringing in the nutrients itself into to provide for this embryoblast. So the embryoblast, what is it gonna do? It's starting to develop the embryo. And we have these things known as germ layers. They're sort of like beginning layers, and there are three of them. We have the endoderm, um, which is going to be, and we think of this as a roll, like a paper towel roll, the cardboard inner paper towel roll. It will be a tube. Right now it's flat. We start off as flat pancakes, but they're going to curve down to become the paper towel roll. The endo, meaning inside, is really going to be our digestive tract and a couple other things. So I like to think of it as sort of going from mouth to anus. If you're a toilet paper roll, one end of the tube is a mouth. The other end of the tube is your anus. And so one food goes in one side and comes out the other side. And our body literally builds around this tube. So the endoderm is the innermost tube. The mesoderm is the next layer. It's gonna be our, most of our other organs, our muscles, our skeleton, our dermis, just everything else is sort of wrapping around the endoderm. And finally, the outermost layer is our ecto. And that's gonna be our brain, our spinal cord, and oddly enough, some our epidermis. So here we are, the three layers, it starts off as a pancake, but in this, this early few days, it actually starts to wrap around to be a tube. So this is looking at the paper towel roll straight on looking down the tunnel. But if you had it nice and long, you have one end that's gonna be the mouth, the other end the anus, or head, if we're living with the echoderm, one end's gonna be the brain, and the other end's gonna be the tail of the spinal cord. So these are the germ layers. You will definitely need to be able to recount what these germ layers are, where they're located, obviously the innermost layer to the outermost layer, and what general organs or components each of these layers will become. So this is a picture from one of my old textbooks of, this is our paper towel roll, but just kind of arched a little bit. So we have our, you don't, it's not as color coded, but you have the endoderm, endoderm, which is gonna be this inner blue part, mesoderm and this guy here is more the purple part and ectoderm is going to be the green part but it's a sideways slice through our curved paper towel roll. So eventually this guy is going to make a placenta. So the placenta is going to be actually the bubble that's around it, sort of not the bubble, so part of it, as well as what's going in to interface with mom. So we want you to realize that we have blood vessels here that are coming from the embryo, but the blood from the embryo does not actually mix with the blood from mom. They just go next to each other, just like blood doesn't go into the air sacs of the lungs, blood will go next to the air sac, so the alveoli of the lung, so that we can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. At the point of the placenta, right in here, we have mom's oxygenated blood, and the oxygen is going to just diffuse, I'm gonna do dots, diffuse over into the baby's blood. Um, the baby's going to send off, diffuse, I'm putting dots here, waste, could be, other metabolic waste, it could be CO2. So there's no mixing of the blood, but there's diffusion that's going to take place. So the placenta also makes a huge amount of hormones, a lot of estrogen and progesterone, plus a whole bunch of other hormones. So the placenta, once it gets built, is going to be the dominant hormone producer in the body um, to support this developing embryo and fetus. 
So we already know about human chorionic gonadotropin. That's the first one that gets released to tell that corpus luteum keep secreting progesterone. Then it actually starts to send out some sort of lactogen. That's going to the breast. That causes early breast changes to say, hey, breast tissue, we're gonna to need to start lactating soon. So this is where we go. We mentioned the other day about the four stages of the breast. If you have the prepubescent boys and girls are all in stage one, a surge of estrogen for females during um, adolescence or males in later life when their testosterone is low and their estrogens are high, you can go to stage two where you have early breast development. Well, having this, puts us into stage three. Men won't get this stage because they don't have, a, we'll never get a placenta. So lactogen is being produced to actually get the breast glandular components of the breast to actually develop further into becoming more active glands. Um, we have placental prolactin. Again, that's going to tell the breast to actually begin to activate and form milk. That will bring it into um, breast level stage four. Um, relaxin. These are hormones that actually tell the mom's skeletal system. Those tight ligaments holding the pelvis together, it actually causes it to relax and stretch. And so that allows for while the weight of the baby sinks down into that pelvic basin, it allows those ligaments to soften so that the hips can spread a little more and accommodate the size of the baby as it develops. It also it just affects the female systemically. So the female can actually have, you know, roll her ankles more easily. It's a little more loosey goosey at this point. So here's another picture of the hormones. So this image here I wanted to show in the first trimester, notice this larger um, arrow. That just means early on the placenta itself is going to make a lot of human chorionic gonadotropin. The ovary themselves, we already know that it's making progesterone. So there we go, that's the progesterone down to the green and the estrogen as well. So none of those hormones are coming from the placenta yet. It's really driven by the ovary in the first trimester, which is the whole point of HCG. HCG is telling the ovary, hey, could you keep churning this out, especially progesterone? That was kind of our primary focus, but it does both. Now, as we go in the second trimester, notice the level of hormones from the ovary are significantly reduced. They made the arrow thinner. The contribution of the placenta itself is so much larger. But then notice the red arrow here is getting smaller. It means our HCG levels are getting lower. So our HCG levels peak out within this first um, trimester. And then finally, the third trimester, there's nothing coming from the ovaries and um, everything's really being driven by the hormones produced by the placenta itself. So the extra embryonic membranes are we first have this yolk sac that is a sort of protrusion sticking out and it literally is like the yolk of a chicken egg this might get you guys not to eat eggs for a little while i don't know i usually really like eggs but it does kind of creep me out when i talk about this part um it's visible by day 10 and i want to point out when i give you an age number oops, here's my pen like day 10, it means from the point of fertilization. And I'm gonna make a qualifier about some clinical assessment later, but right now, everything comes from that 24 hours right after ovulation and fertilization takes place. All the aging that I'm gonna talk about is from that point. Um, so early on, so about a week and a half later, you get the yolk sac developed early blood cells, early digestive respiratory system while those germ layers are forming. The amnion is actually the bubble that the embryo is in. So even if they're twins or triplets, every little embryo has its own independent amnion. It's like its own little spacesuit. It's going to cushion the embryo, allows for movement within this little bubble, um, but they get their own even if there are multiples in the uterus. The allantosis is this connecting stock. It's like an embryo placenta link. Ultimately, it's going to become the umbilical cord, but it's this sort of anchor point early on called the allantosis or allantois. The chorion. Now, the chorion is sort of the baby side of the placenta. 
it's usually smooth, it wraps around the entire embryo and fetus. Now, this is the case if there are two or three multiple embryos in there, they will each have their, I'll put, draw another kid in here, um, they'll have their own amnion, but if you have twins, they're gonna share a chorion, but they are all gonna have their own amnions. That's why I was to think of it like, still their own spacesuit, but they have the chorion that would be in common if there are multiples. So this is an actual image, this is sort of our first real image. We can see the remnant of the yolk sac. This um, is actually at the very, this little guy is at the end of the fetal stage. So we can, I only can tell that because you can see its toes. So, sorry, the end of the embryonic stage, I apologize. So this is the end of the first trimester. The yolk sac is actually receding by this point. Um, the head is still large in proportion to the body, um, but everything is really in place by this point. The rest of the um, development really is marked about more maturation and further enlargement. The whole first trimester is about putting all these elements in place. But we really see over here, this is the chorionic villi. The villi are the finger-like projections. This is what the trophoblast made when it was tapping into all of the glandular components of the endometrium that eventually became blood vessel structures. And then we can see actually now at this point there, there's actually a true umbilical cord because the villi are now vascular. So this picture here, we see an early, early embryo. We can see um, there's the yolk sac, at the, oh, sorry, the yolk sac, there's the yolk sac's way over here, but we have the allantosis and we can see, actually we'll talk, there's the eyes, they're gonna be way on the sides of the head. A lot of these, what they're called gill slits. So at this stage, it's hard to tell. Is it a human? Is it a horse? Is it a chicken? They all, we all kind of look the same at this point. So this is really where we're quite similar. Um, this here is definitely getting more human. You can see some paddle-like hands. Um, gray image of the amnionic sac, so you can really see the delicate nature of its own little bubble. We can see the vessels of the placenta over here, as well as a chorionic villi, and this yolk sac. So the umbilical cord, and we've done this before in unit two when we talked about vessels. Remember there are two umbilical arteries and a single umbilical vein. Now remember an artery means leaving the heart. And this is from the perspective of the baby. So arteries are actually leaving the baby and going to the placenta where the vein is going to bring, so again, this is where it's kind of opposite, the vein is gonna actually bring oxygenated blood back into this um, embryo fetus. So what we see here are the two umbilical arteries. They're in blue because they are deoxygenated blood heading out to the placenta and then we have an umbilical vein coming back in to the umbilical cord, um, to the belly button, sorry. And then it goes to the liver first. Remember, baby says, I need to filter out whatever I'm getting. Who knows where mom's been up to? So I'm gonna send everything to the liver first, and then it will then go to the vena cava and then off to the rest of the body. So in summary, what we have so far is we formed a zygote, that is after the egg, um, sperm and egg get together. It's now a 46 chromosome cell. It develops exponentially to become a marola, then a blastocyst. You should know about the blastocyst components, the embryoblast and the trophoblast. What's going on at the point of implantation? Most importantly, the trophoblast is very important at this, at this stage. What are the extra embryonic membranes that are formed? Um, the role of the placenta with regard to hormones and as well as the elements of the umbilical cord. So we'll just do a little further development. So this embryonic stage is going to be nine weeks. This is our first trimester. We go through the germ layer differentiation. So we already talked about the three germ layers, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. It's during this stage that we're forming the placenta, the umbilical cord gets made, the bubbles and the extra embryonic membranes get made around this embryo. 
The neural tube in this phase is actually the ectoderm, so that's the brain and spinal cord part. And so if we're talking about a pancake, this is when we're in flat pancake territory before it curves to become the um, paper towel tube. So it's the ectoderm that we have the flat pancake, but all of a sudden we have these ridges that form. So if you were to have a piece of paper and then to fold it so it has these two little wrinkled ridges that rise up and ultimately these ridges will curve and the points of these two ridges are actually going to come in together. So we can see that when they meet and they come in together, that's this here. They're meeting and coming in together. And they start at the middle. So this was normal, this one was looking, it's a superior view. So it's looking from the top. So we'll say, and this will be head. I'm gonna put down here, this is the tail. And so now we're looking straight at its back, if you wanna think of it from the top to bottom. This here is, this view is if there was a slice right through it and we're looking at it in a transverse perspective. So this sort of opened part here is more of what you'll see like on this part. So it's not sealed up together. But when it's sealed up like this, that's what we see over here. And it happens in the middle and then it seals up um, um, caudally or cranially as well as caudally. So it's sealing up like a Ziploc bag from the middle outward. It is critical that this, these two ends meet together. If they don't meet and it stays wide open, you're not going to form the spinal cord. You're not going to then form the vertebrae that go around it. You're not gonna form the bones that then have to go around that. So you have to get this tiny tube that will become the head to, from head to tail, which will become the brain and spinal cord, but it has to seal together. So you have to form this neural tube. So we can see some of these pictures here, day 22. So it's within the first three weeks. So this is our third week that we're actually sealed up and it's, it's still open here and open here. So then we can see how it's further sealed up to this point. Um, we can actually see it's still open here. So we can see from there to where it's sealed within, and that's only happened within four days. And it finally is continuing to extend further. So this is gonna ultimately become the brain and this is going to become the end of the spinal cord. Another picture here of where it was flat, flat like a pancake, um, even though the bottom is actually arching down to become our paper towel roll, we have these ridges that are gonna form here, and then they're gonna come together, and then they become a tube, and then we still have our paper towel roll, so it's a tube on a tube. That's actually what the brain looks like from the side where the head part starts to um, enlarge quite a bit. So we can see within the first three to five weeks, this actually was an ectopic pregnancy. This was a image of an embryo removed from the female because it was implanted within the fallopian tube and they don't distend. So about, about five weeks is where there's a really, really sharp pain and um, because of the rapid growth going on um, and because of the lack of distension of the fallopian tubes, a very, very sharp pain will happen on one side or the other, obviously depending on which fallopian tube is being affected. And um, the only way is it has to be removed and it can't be re-implanted. But here you can see, here's where the ears are, way down here. Eyes are way lateral. If you saw this little guy from the head on. It looks like a pig. It's got a wide flat pig nose and the eyes are way off to the side. But you can see how at this stage we're really starting to see finger lines, but then the feet follow. Their feet are about a week behind the development of the hands. We can also see the brain here. Sorry, I'm about to sneeze. Mm, sorry. Sort of allergies are starting to kick in now that it's springtime. Okay, so this is sort of a weird sketch representation. So from the third week post-conception, we start to get this sort of dorsal midline. We're getting the neural tube formed. It's starting to come together. It's not all the way together yet. 
Um, and then this is where it is imperative that the embryo gets folic acid. Folic acid is one of our B vitamins. It, this is the point where a female will go to her doctor and say, hey, I think I'm pregnant. In fact, the third week is the week that the female is expecting her period. So it's the one that the female is expecting to be the first week of her next cycle. So she may say, hmm, I didn't get my period. I, if she's one that can predict it and expect it on a particular day, might say, hey, I'm a couple, couple days late. Let me take a pregnancy test. And so at this point, they would identify it as being positive. And she may or may not get an appointment with her doctor. She should. And then maybe another week later or two, then the doctor says, hey, you need to get, take folic acid. Well, if you wait two weeks, right, week five, the, full, the neural tube is done being made. You're done forming the basic element of the brain and spinal cord. So obviously prenatal vitamins are really helpful for a number of things, but the whole point of administering prenatal vitamins was really to catch it by this third week, which is way before most women even go to their doctor which is also why many of our foods are fortified with folic acid. So whether a female takes vitamins or not, and she should have some sort of basic level of health because folic acid, it's not just for developing babies. It's for a lot of other things. It's anti-cancer, it's anti-heart um, disease. It does a lot of other good things. So it actually just makes sense to have good nutrition anyways. But folic acid is critical here. You can bet your bottom dollar if there was a pharmaceutical replacement that actually said, hey, we're gonna prevent birth defects um, by taking XYZ drugs. No, nope, they haven't found one that actually replaces folic acid. So folic acid is critical to take in order for this neural tube to finally seal up. And you have to have it no later than the third week of development. The fourth week, we're finally getting a heart beating. And now it's not formed a heart, it's just a blob of cells that are twitching. So that's a beating heart by this fourth week. Very rapidly, it actually forms chambers and, and eventually it'll start to circulate blood. But this is where the fourth week, it's actually a cluster of cells that are now twitching and starting to form the cavities within the heart. Um, we're starting to get the eye, lenses, things like that. The fifth week, well, of course, the folic acid was there to make the whole neural tube at this point. Now we're actually getting, you know, enlarged lumpy sections that's going to become different regions of the brain. And we're starting to get those weird little paddle-like hands with finger ridges. So this is what's going on in these first three to five weeks. So this is what's going on in week three is really the next cycles, week one, menstrual period. So that gives you a sense of perspective. If a egg gets fertilized, you're building a brain right when you're like, hey, I missed my period. I wonder if I'm pregnant or not. Um, and then the next week goes along and this is what's being developed. So things move rapidly once it becomes an embryo. This slide is only here to let you know, obviously here's a paper, it's um, from quite a long time ago, I forgot, um, but it's still effective. Uh, should have the date on here, I don't have it here, it's down on the bottom of the page, but it's folic acid for the prevention of neural tube defects. It is still the, you want about 400 uh, micrograms of folic acid per day. You can get it from a number of sources. But I threw this other one in because a couple years ago I saw, I mean, we've always known it, but all of a sudden every once in a while some nutrition makes some sort of world headlines. So um, this looks like it was the Daily Mail from England where they talked about folic acid reducing the risk of blood pressure and stroke by almost 75%. Yeah, that and a lot of other things. Duh, just having good nutrition is going to help you be, you know, prevent a lot of things. And I, there's a bunch of papers on cancer and so on. So again, folic acid, not just for babies. Here's just, this is, we're on a little side trip here. You don't have to say this um, or know this, but it's figure, well, since I'm making a big deal about it, I might as well tell you where you can get it in your everyday food. So eat your broccoli, eat your spinach. The good rule of thumb is the darker, richer colors, the more um, nutrients you're going to have in it. Cauliflower is a little bit different. It's one of the few white vegetables that you can eat that actually has some good. But again, iceberg lettuce, that's just useless. I mean, if you're gonna eat lettuce, you might as well eat something that's got something dark and leafy. 
Alrighty, back to the task at hand. So this is a really cool picture of an early embryo. Nice view of the early limb development as well as our little gill slits where the eye would be. We haven't gotten the um, choroid in there to show the pigment quite yet. So this is a labeled view of this guy. So you can actually see it's five millimeters. So it's a half a centimeter. You can still see it. It's not microscopic. It's pretty small though. So these are the levels. So we talked about five weeks is where you have these sort of paddle-like hands with these little finger ridges. That's about five weeks along, but we can see by six weeks, so the very next week, we have these little stumpy cartoon fingers. And then by the end of the eighth week, it actually looks like a real hand. And so again, I want to remind you, by week nine, that's the end of our first trimester, everything's really there. It's just small and maybe not quite as in proportion, still is a giant head. But you can see that, hey, this is not quite a normal hand yet. But by the time we get to the end of this first trimester, everything looks relatively normal. So this is really, the, um, the first trimester is really about setting the groundwork for any of the subsequent growth. So again, here, this is a five week old um, embryo. We can see the next week, six weeks, where the fingers are starting to form. Now we have the ridges along the feet. Then we have seven weeks. Now look, we're getting toes, we have feet. You actually see the, through this clear um, membrane that is really gonna be the skull, you can actually see the blood vessels and you can see the frontal bones um, where they will cover. This is actually the brain underneath here. We can see the eyes have pigments, they're still pretty lateral. So we have brain differentiation. That means we've got the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brain stem. So it's actually differentiated into different parts of the brain and we're getting the retinal pigment. So it actually should be the choroid. Um, so that's the dark part there as well as the limbs are developing. And then we get to the end of the eighth week. So by week nine, it's pretty much, and I say distinctly human, obviously it was always human, but it looked like early on, we looked like a horse or any other animal, but now we got limbs, we're, we don't have a tail, so if, we were, if it was a cat at this point, it still retained its tail. Our coccyx stays small, we don't have a tail extending from that, so it's definitely recognizable as being just human at this point. And the nervous system begins to operate. So, that doesn't mean it's sitting there thinking about you know mathematical equations it's literally the wiring got put in that neural tube form brain to tail and then coming off of the neural tube at each part if you remember the dermatome map it's actually going out and connecting with the muscles that were made and it's at this point if you were to look in on a video you'd see this little embryo guy randomly twitching and twerking in different directions that really is like an electrician when he's wiring your house and you know turning on the lights on and off hey does this work is this wiring connecting to where i think it's going to so the this nervous system is really like twitching these muscles all around to make sure the impulse is going from the brain to the muscle it has yet to be coordinated but that comes very very quickly but this is where the movements are more um, not as purposeful quite yet. So this is the end of the embryo stage. So it's right at this point, we're gonna then move on into the fetal stage. So this is where the images, I think, become a lot, lot more disturbing. So you can see that on the right is more of a computer model and the left is an actual, um, an actual end of embryo early fetus stage. So this is week nine. And so we have been talking about gestational age. And that means from the point that it became a zygote, which if we're dealing with a female with a 20 day cycle, that was, you know, day 14, 15, if you got a 24 hour to get fertilized. So if it got fertilized on day 15, this is week nine from that point. But clinically, it's week 11. So those of you that are used to working in the clinic, everything that I'm gonna tell you is gonna be two weeks early. They just add on a random two weeks. So if, you know, if we're at the development stage three, so to speak, we talked about week three being where that neural tube's forming, we need folic acid, your um, embryologist, your OBGYN, not embryologist, your OBGYN is gonna tell you, oh, you're at week five. 
because they're counting the two weeks in that follicular phase as part of development. Now, I personally don't agree with that because uh, not all women have a 20 day cycle. Some women have a longer cycle and that's the most variable stage. So it makes it harder to age until you actually get an ultrasound and they can plug a number onto you. But anyways, I wanted to point out there's gonna be two weeks difference for consistency, I'm sticking with gestational age, but those of you guys that are used to clinical stuff, you're gonna to have to add two weeks to it. So now we're in the last part of our lecture. We're just gonna talk about the second and third trimesters. I just fixed this in your, I think it said something else um, in your notes that you have, I had printed out for you or I had posted for you. Um, yeah, I think it just said second, but I was just finishing it, second and third, and then we're gonna talk about twins. So here's a picture at 12 weeks of age. You can see it's still within its amniotic sac at this point. So this was removed. Um, it's now at the fetal stage and this is what it looks like after um, the amniotic sac has been taken apart. And you can see by 12 weeks how big it is compared to somebody's hand. So this fetal stage is now 30 weeks long. This is where just growth and specialization, but that embryonic stage, that first trimester, is where all the basic elements are put into place. You, you know, you can't even grow if you don't even form the neural tube. You can't grow a brain if you don't have a neural tube. You can't grow fingers if you hadn't made those paddles. So that embryonic stage is the most important. This fetal stage is now just enhancing what was already put in place. So here we're just looking at basic benchmarks. From the ninth to 11th week, the head is still big as the body. So proportionally, the head is just as big as the body. The eyes are still far apart. It's still a little bit funky looking, but we're starting to get ossification centers. That means this thing is still, this boy or girl is still made of cartilage. The bones are, but it's only now bone cells are starting to arrive on the scene. By the end of the 12th week, which would be um, so if you add two, 14th, you can actually tell if it's a boy or girl. Now, it was always determined whether it was a boy or girl based on the sperm, whether it was an X or Y chromosome. However, at this point, genitalia development has produced either a penis or not. That's really how you can tell. Either there's a penis or there isn't. So um, at this point, that's the protrusion, and you can tell if you're looking at an ultrasound. It's actually doing normal digestive functions, and it's this time that the nervous system and work muscles are working together. So this is early on where there is consciousness in its motion. So it's sort of like random kicking, you know, went to kick and the mom may or may not, it's really early, but may or may not feel the kicking. But then the kicking become purposeful. Sometimes, you know, moms have experienced that they touch their belly, there's kicking that goes against it. So sometimes it's starting to be in response. This is where people will say, you know, if people, the baby hears a certain music or, you know, the mom gets excited because the father comes home, baby feels that kind of um, hormonal and emotional response and they may respond to that. This is quite early, but this is the initial part of actually developing cognitive response response from the outside world and it's going to then elicit a purposeful muscular contraction. So you should really know the end of this time is kind of that's the most important benchmark that most parents are concerned with at this point. Um, this is where you can see that's the stage there at the 12 weeks. So you can see a fair bit of difference from the 10 to 12 week age. You can see that the skin is a lot more um, a more like it's regular skin. You can actually see the ears and eyes are in a better position. Um, the face isn't over here in the 10 week stage. It's going to be really flat faced and the eyes are coming more um, forward. You're actually getting sunken in more facial features are forming. So the 13th to the 16th, we're starting to get longer limbs. We're starting to get specialized facial features. But the most important on this slide is by the end of the 16th week, the skeleton. So remember, we talked about, I'm gonna go back a couple slides. Let's erase this. The ossification centers, they're starting here in the 9th and 11th. So that means the bone cells are just starting to form. But it's when we get to the end of this 16th week that we actually now have limbs because they are all ossified at this point. So you can actually see it on x-ray. 
although you shouldn't be getting an x-ray at this point if you have a baby in there because you can cause some damage, but you could see it if you did. Um, you're actually able to see the heart or hear the heart rate quite easily through the abdomen. I wanted to do, I'm gonna stop sharing really quick. I brought into, these are skull representations. Okay, so they're not the real ones. I have a real one in my office, but I didn't think it was appropriate to bring home. So um, these are bone clones, so they're plastic. Um, well, not really plastic, but they're kind of a plastic a resin type thing. So they're not real bones, but I wanted to show you these were two stages. Let's see what the ages are. I meant to 32 weeks and 40 weeks. This one's 40 weeks and 32 weeks. You can kind of see um, the age difference there. But I wanted to show you the skull at the top, the soft spot. So we'll take this younger one here. Oops. And so as we talked about, and actually the real one I have in my office, you can really see, let me see if the light will shine it. Um, this bump, see the way the light, you can kind of see the shadowing on this side over here versus the light on this side. Um, they have these little pointy protrusions and on the real skull, it's actually more prominent. Um, and that's where the, let me move it here the ossification centers are, and then it grows radially out. And you can see on the top where these are the two parietal bones, and they're not quite filled in. And then you can see even the frontal bone, which is normally our forehead, and it's normally one massive bone, it's still split down the middle. So there's just a membrane here. So this area is the membrane that you could literally put your finger down and push down into the brain. So this is the soft spot. So in the older, one here, you can see how the soft spot has remained because the corners haven't quite filled in. And we even have soft spots here on the side by the sphenoidal, um, where the sphenoid um, bone kind of sticks out from the side as well as the temporal bones there. So, and there's a number of soft spots elsewhere as well. The most prominent one is this anterior fontanel. Um, but I wanted to point that out as far as ossification centers go. So let's go back to our lecture. The last um, portion here, I have here, fetus can survive if born. Well, that's kind of backed up. I'm not sure where we are now. I think we're up to 24 weeks. I haven't updated this for a while, but you can see there's sort of like this, we have this weird covering that's um, going to protect the skin because it's in this liquid environment, obviously. Um, the skin is still translucent, so we haven't developed pigmentation. No matter what someone's race is, um, the and their ethnicity, the fetus at this point doesn't have any pigment. It's just more see-through skin and the pigment will kick in later as the melanin production begins, but it's not uncommon for um, children of or fetuses that are going to be born at this point to not have pigmentation um, irregardless of their ethnicity um, that will come along later. Um, so at this point, the fetus is rotating down, head towards cervix in anticipation of being born. So it can be born pretty safely anytime after the 26th, 27th week. You obviously can have some monitoring, um, but it actually, you know, with modern day technology, those dates have backed up a bit. For twins, we have two types. There's identical twins, meaning they're mono. The prefix mono means same monozygotic. If they're fraternal, they're known as dizygotic. So fraternal is two separate eggs. Here's an egg and here's an egg and two separate sperm where the identical twin came from one egg and one sperm. So they're going to have a single chorion. Um, so each, each one does. So each little individual um, twin has its um, own amnion two amnions, if it's gonna be twins, but they're gonna have the single chorion and placenta. I have a picture, it's probably gonna be easier if we look at this. So on this side, if we look at fraternal twins, we have two eggs, those are two separate eggs, and two separate sperm, and they get implanted. They're like just two completely separate people, just happen to be in the uterus at the same time. So they're, you know, it could be a boy, a girl, it could be two boys, it could be two girls. They're just there and there at the same time. The most common scenario is that both ovaries release an egg at the same time. Sperm fertilized two different eggs. They came in independently. Usually 
there's a feedback mechanism where one ovary releases the egg and the other doesn't. But that doesn't always happen. So in this case, likely both ovaries release an egg. They both independently got fertilized. So these are two different DNA. The identical twins are really quite interesting. At the blastocyst stage, this embryoblast or the embryo, notice instead of being one lump, like a normal embryoblast, it actually forms two lumps. It literally split. To me, I find this fascinating because you have a blob of cells at the embryoblast that would form normally, eventually a child. But at this stage, you literally cut the cells in half and now you made two. So it's amazing how it plays catch up right away and you know, will accelerate the growth to form, still stay on the proper trajectory for development. But this is why it has the same DNA. It came from the same sperm and egg, but it's just at this blastocyst state, the embryoblast split into two blobs. Now you can also see if the split was not, let me erase this, if the split was not complete, and some of the cells stayed in common, you can see how that can form conjoined twins. And it really is whatever that portion is. Is it gonna stay the brain or was that gonna be the shoulder cells or the back cells? So it sort of determines where the conjoined twins are indeed conjoined. So this is what's going on with identical twins. Let me go to this side. So we can see this picture, this is 11 weeks old. You can see they had separate placentas because they were separate placentas, although it looks like they're kind of fused together there. I'm going by what the caption on the image had said, those would have been fraternal twins. Um, so in this case, this is identical. Identical is gonna have their own amnion, but then a common chorion where fraternal is gonna have everything separate. So this final slide here is letting you know that obviously between this guy and this guy, they're identical twins. So they came from one egg. And then obviously she's a girl. So she came from a totally different egg. So likely their mother had released two eggs. The, these guys, their embryoblast had cleaved into two different blobs to become two identical people, where the other egg just stayed, the blast embryo blast and the blastocyst stayed whole, and she was, so they were all three implanted in the uterus at the same time, so so you can do that. Alrighty. Okay, that's it, that's all I got for you. Next time I see you, we will be doing um, a review.